da, tări. Bună. Te am da. A tăi ce mă gucigi. So many people who are interested and have requested me uh, if I could confer uh, the outlook of the Shura initiation. I can't. And therefore, I am doing this on the internet. Last year, I think I did the uh, Avalokiteshvara uh, great initiation uh, through, on, uh, through webcast. And so through that, many uh, Tibetans inside Tibet, um, so I have told people from inside Tibet that I would also intend and uh, visualize to give the initiation uh, to them and they should also have the same intention to receive it. So with regard to the highest yoga tantra, uh, there are the practices of keeping the highest uh, yoga tantra uh, vows, the tantric vows, and therefore, as a preliminary to the um, as a preliminary to the, the cycle of Manjushri teachings, I gave the uh, Yamantaka initiation, and so that was done on for a few disciples. But this initiation, I'm giving it. Uh, on the um, um, through this webcast, and so if you uh, keep your attention uh, single pointedly and, uh, and have the uh, motivation to receive, and I also have the intention, then you will receive it. And so, Avalokiteshvara uh, is a deity of compassion, as uh, his uh, one verse praise says. So, of course, cultivate uh, uh, compassion is something that we need to uh, cultivate through meditation and visualization and uh, familiarization. And then, uh, if you do the practice of Avalokiteshvara and visualize Avalokiteshvara, and, uh, before you and so forth, and make prayer to Avalokiteshvara, it also helps to uh, um, increase your compassion. And so for the Bodhisattvas, as it is said, they, they, with wisdom they focus on enlightenment and with compassion on sentient beings. And so here, with regards to the wisdom, it has to be coupled with the compassion, and the wisdom here is not uh, as, uh, wisdom that's gone astray, but the correct uh, per, uh, wisdom. <laughs> so all seven billion people on this earth do not want suffering, but are uh, want happiness that's the same with everyone. So we see in the news channels, the media, about discrimination on the basis of color or religion these days, and then there's killing due to that. And then there are some who even take it as a pride to be able to kill somebody or others. Yes, just yesterday I saw in, on the television news, somewhere in Minnesota or somewhere in America, so one uh, black person was, had actually fallen under a car, and a police came, and he actually uh, pushed his knee on the neck of that black person. So because of this discrimination, racism, on the basis of race, this such things are done. And then there is also um, people causing lots of violence and conflict on the basis of uh, religious discrimination, sectarianism. 
So basically, we as human beings, our nature is compassionate. So all sentient beings, even a small insect or a small bug, has to survive through compassion. So of course, the bugs do not get milk from its mother, but the mother takes care of the baby. And so if you pay attention, so all living beings with the f experience of feeling and sensation survive through compassion, love. And therefore, if we as human beings do not harm one another, but help one another, serve one another, and be compassionate with another, then we will have a peaceful world which is free from, uh, without any fear, anxiety. Um, without compassion, if you actually let your life be carried away by jealousy, uh, pride, arrogance, and uh, uh, anger and hatred, then there will not be happiness for yourself as well as individuals, and therefore, compassion is very crucial for our survival. I usually ta have uh, talk about my four major commitments. So the first commitment has to do with the 7 billion people having, um, being compassionate. So if you are more compassionate, the more compassionate you are, you are happier. If you are full of a um, sense of competition, jealousy, and so forth, then you will not be happy. As we say in the prayer, in order to fulfill the um, aims or interests of oneself, myself, and others, I shall uh, cultivate or develop bodhicitta. And so, for your, even when you, if in, even if you want happiness for yourself, you need to practice this and uh, uh, bodhicitta, and if, if you wish happiness for others, for that also but you need happiness, uh, bodhicitta. And therefore, love and compassion is something which is beneficial to all sentient beings, and particularly human beings. As human beings, we have this marvelous intelligence. When it serves as a slave of our negative, destructive emotions, and then we cause all kinds of havoc. Whereas if this wisdom or intelligence is used constructively, then it can be beneficial to yourself and others. And therefore, it is very important to have a good heart or warm heart. Though we, all of us, are in same in not wanting suffering but wanting happiness, but ma many of us actually seek happiness from outside uh, and do not pay attention to our inner world of mind. So the material development through materialist, through the modern uh, uh, education <clears throat> does not pay attention to the, uh, the fact that our um, happiness or suffering depends on whether we have disciplined, controlled mind or uncontrolled and undisciplined mind. So without only focusing on intellect, intellect alone, but combining it with a warm heart, we need that. And so this is what I focus on, I emphasize. So I tell people that as human beings, we need to be warm-hearted. This will help yourself as well as others and the world at large. Though everyone is the same in not wanting suffering but wanting happiness, but how much suffering there is co uh, as a result of human wrongdoings. And this is because of our negative destructive emotions, like 
attachment, anger, and so forth. So we are not talking only about the past, uh, future lives, but even in this life, we need the warm heart to be, to have happiness. And so, with regards to Avalokiteshvara, who is the deity of compassion, as a, someone who believes in re religion, if we could also recite the mantra of Avalokiteshvara, the six-syllable mantra, that also will um, serve as an um, uh, catalyst or helps in uh, increasing our compassion. And so the main purpose of giving the Avalokiteshvara initiation is to have a good heart. And so whether you are a Buddhist or not, doesn't matter. This is the purpose. So as human beings, if we are, I mean, if we could be a good people, that would be very helpful. So all the major religious traditions of the world, though they are philosophically different, have different philosophical uh, ideas, but uh, all these religious traditions teach love, compassion, uh, self-discipline, tolerance, and patience, uh, self-discipline, and therefore, there is every reason for the religious, for these religions to be harmonious with one another. And therefore, in connection with promotion of love and compassion, we need to promote this, promote uh, the, the religious harmony. Otherwise, if people, uh, I mean, people would say that uh, they talk about love and compassion, but they're the ones, the religions, people following the religions are the ones who fight amongst themselves. And therefore, we need to make people understand that compassion Love and compassion are the foundation for our happiness. Even for our physical health, we need peaceful mind and compassionate mind. And even the scientists say that. And they also say that the innate or the basic human nature is compassionate. So this is not talking about religion, but something which we can actually experience, see from our own experience in life. So the more compassionate and loving you are, you are happier, the happier you are. And so the, the second commitment that I have is this, because all religions teach, Compassion, love, if you practice these, then uh, and there will be uh, the, the, the second commitment that I have is, uh, my second commitment is religious harmony. So if you practice love and compassion, you'll be more calm, gentle, and so forth. So this is not impossible, religious harmony. In India, if you look at India, it is an example for religious harmony. There are many different religious traditions, like the Sankhya school, and then uh, other uh, Vedic traditions and Jainism and so forth. So, as Chandrakirti says, so all these religious traditions, though they are different, they have lived harmoniously, coexisted in India. There's no um, uh, account of people killing one another in the name of religion. And then religions that have emigrated to India, such as Christianity, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, and so forth, also coexist in this land of India. So for over a thousand years, this religious harmony has existed in India, and therefore we can see this is possible. And so my, I talk about religious harmony as my second commitment. And then as the third commitment is, as a Tibetan, Tibetans um, put their hope in me. And I have karmic connection with Tibetans as well, and they trust me. So one year, 
I was traveling in the uh, northeastern part of India in a small plane, and it was quite turbulent. So I, I actually feared what would happen to the six million Tibetans. What would happen to them if I died? So, so they, the, the Tibetans put their faith, uh, trust on me, and trust me. They put their hope on me and trust me. So, uh, accordingly, I need to think of benefiting and helping them as much as I can. So when people respect me, and I also have the responsibility towards them, so we are in exile. So we have lost our country and become refugees and exiles. But this has also become a blessing in disguise. So for over a thousand years, we have a very unique a strong connection with India. We call India the noble land of India. So the Buddha himself appeared in India, and then Master Nagarjuna and his disciples and followers, as well as Asanga and his disciples and followers, have were Indians. So, our knowledge, the source or the origin of our knowledge, Buddhism and so forth, is India. And therefore, India today, being a democratic country, I, I had a connection, I had a connection with Pandit uh, Nehru, the first Indian Prime Minister. And then I have many Indian leaders who are my fr friends. And so in India, we have freedom to help and benefit Tibetans as well as other people in the world. And therefore, becoming exiles has been a blessing in disguise for us. So we in exile, and particularly the monastic institutions of uh, the learning institutions, here uh, I can see on television uh, the monitor, Gaden Chirambuche and other masters and monks. So you are the ones who are the custodians of this tradition, the Nalanda tradition of Buddhism, which today we can, with, uh, with which we can today have discussions with modern scientists as well. And then we can actually um, make contribution to the world at large through our knowledge. So I have mentioned this before, and you also are doing a service to our own culture and religion, to the Tibetans, and through them to the world at large. And so we, the Tibetans in exile, have actually lived a life worth living, even as exiles. So politics is something different, but the most important thing is for over a thousand years since Chandrakshita passed this Nalanda tradition on to us, in which we, we can actually practice, which we can use, practice through reason and logic. So this we can call this Nalanda tradition that we have as the treasure of the world. So this is something which even non-believers can take interest in and they 
can and they would. So as a Tibetan, in order to fulfill the Tibetan wish, so when we first came into exile in India, so the, the people were calling the, uh, us Lamaism, Thurman and Berzin, Alex Berzin and Bob Thurman know this. So people actually perceived our tradition as something where there is emphasis, so much emphasis on wearing different hats. But today, we we know that this Tibetan Buddhist tradition is accepted as Nalanda tradition, which can actually have sit together with modern scientists, and from whom the, who also uh, learn. Uh, beneficial lessons from our tradition. So the tradition is some a part of Indian tradition, but in India, what has happened is the materialistic uh, education spread in India and also that has taken the toll on Indian um, uh, traditional knowledge. So India more or less has become materialistic over the last centuries. And today we have more and more as a result of me urging Indians to revive their own ancient tradition knowledge, wisdom, there are more and more number of Indians taking interest in doing that. And so I'm going to give this initiation of Avalokiteshwara because there is need for promotion of compassion in the world today. So we'll do the uh, preliminary process of the initiation. So first, we have the preparation for the students, disciples. So usually when we do this kind of initiation, we do the, the offering of torma to uh, this obstacle spirits. But I do not do this anymore. As we actually reflect on these lines from Shanti Deva's Bodhisattva Charaya Avatara, today, before the, uh, all the protectors, I call on all sentient beings to the feast of enlightenment and, in the meantime, that of happiness while within the cycling existence. And therefore, gods, demigods, and so forth be joyous. So while saying this prayer, if we actually do these rituals to drive away the so-called evil spirits, beings, I mean, these beings would be, may, uh, may um, have, may suspect what kind of person is this? In the morning, the, this person actually says, um, all sentient beings are my, um, I mean, I'm dear to me and so forth, whereas in the evening, he does this ritual of driving us away. So therefore, I do not...
do the gektor, the torm offering to drive away um, oh, yeah. evil spirits. So I just do the uh, torm offering for local uh, spirit deities or landlords. So Chirambuche is offering the mandala. Gaden Chirambuche. May the sound of the great drama drum dispel the suffering of beings. May the Guru live for inconceivably eons to give us teachings. Please sit down. <coughs> so now, as I said, historically, Tibet. Um, there's some reason or justification for saying that Tibet uh, is the land um, to be tamed by Avalokiteshvara. So if you look at history, since the time of times of T the Tibetan Dharma King Songtsen Gampo and Tisung Detsen and so forth, many great lamas and leaders had almost um, all of them had a uh, connection with Chandrasik, Avalokiteshvara, and therefore Avalokiteshvara is considered as the patron deity of Tibet or the special deity of Tibet to tame the land of Tibet. And generally speaking, Tibetans seem to have a good nature, a kind nature. So we are a people who have a special connection with Avalokiteshvara. And the Buddha himself has said that his teaching would spread from north to north, meaning north from India is Tibet, and from there north is Mongolia. So the Tibet is also a land which was prophesied by the Buddha himself, and therefore we have a connection with him as well. And so we as Tibetans, generally speaking, are kind people, and therefore Avalokiteshvara, we have a special uh, karmic connection with Avalokiteshvara. After coming into exile in India, from Dzongar Chede Monastery, Dzongar Chede Monastery, from the western part of Tibet, near the border of Nepal. And so in the um, life story of the fifth Dalai Lama, there's mention of there were three Avalokiteshvara statues or images. One from the uh, one is called Wadi Sangpo, and the other is. So when there was a turmoil in Tibet, Wadi Sangpo was actually taken from Tib uh, Tibet to Nepal and from there to India. So after it came here, and then when the Dzongkachete monks were moving from Dharamsala to South India, <laughs> I did a divination whether whether the uh, uh, Wadisangpo statue of Avalokiteshvara should go with the monks of Dzongkha Chede Monastery who brought it from Tibet to here, uh, or should stay here. 
And it's, uh, the, the divination showed that uh, the Wadi Sangpo should stay here. So it seems Wadi Sangpo also likes fame because <laughs> of me. So I live as a caretaker of Wadi Sangpo of Lokiteshwaras. And its face seems to change um, appearance or moods. One night I had a dream of Wadi Sangpo. He was there in front of me like a human person. And I was asking, do you uh, realize emptiness? He said, yes. And he, I asked, do you realize emptiness directly? He said, yes. And so we were talking like person to person. And so I would look at the Shwara statue of Wadi Sangpo is something very unique. And so I also think, usually, always think, of course, I'm not a manifestation or emanation of Avalokiteshvara, Arya Avalokiteshvara, but I consider myself as a messenger of Avalokiteshvara or emissary. So today we are doing that 1,000 armed, 1,000 eyed Avalokiteshvara initiation. We are going to first do the preliminary process of the initiation. As I did the self-generation and also the, uh, the, uh, I also did the uh, self-initiation. So imagine me as Avalokiteshvara himself. The most important thing to receive, to take uh, 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 tantric <coughs> uh, teachings is to have the, a pure motivation. And therefore, in the ritual itself, we go through this, these outlines, <coughs> correcting the motivation and generating into the principal deity, making requests and fostering firm conviction in Nadriyana, taking vows and receiving blessings, draw and so forth. So whatever work we do or activity we engage in, there must be a good intention or motivation. So, of course, material progress and de development were meant for the good of human beings, but they, as the, we made more progress, this, we used this progress and development to kill and harm others. And therefore, unless you have a good motivation, it doesn't help. So, if you have a good motivation and intention, then we can have a peaceful and happy society. So, without that good intention or motivation, <clears throat> even if you may be doing a dharma practice, apparently, um, ostensibly you may be doing dharma practice, but it's uh, in, in reality you are not doing a dharma practice. So some people who take interest in Tantra, it says, do so for the benefit of this life alone. Tantra is meant for achieving <coughs> Buddhahood. <coughs> Sorry. So in Tantra, there is the uh, practice whereby you uh, fulfill or achieve the unique causes for um, uh, getting the unique so causes, causes for uh, attaining the two bodies of a uh, Buddha by um, visualizing and imagining yourself as a deity and doing your practice accordingly. And so, to reach Buddhahood, uh, Nagarjuna has said, through the accumulation of merit and wisdom, may I be able to complete them to attain the form and form body and the wisdom body of a Buddha, or Dharma body of a Buddha. 
So, of course, the mantra has to be practiced in secrecy. So, of course, those who do understand the, tarma, the, the tantra would actually understand this. So, in the text, it says some seek to practice secret dharma, wish, uh, seeking to practice secret dharma, wish to enter the mandala here. Some others desire merit, and uh, still others seeking something other than that. The intelligent ones who seek the future lives should faithfully strive for transcendence. <clears throat> So, if you seek tantric initiation like this in order to have a good life, long life and so forth in this life and also a good life in the future as well as nirvana for yourself alone, there are wrong motivations to receive that. So, therefore, it says the intelligence who seek the future lives should faithfully strive for transcendence and enter the mandala, not desiring the results for this life, if one strives for this life alone, the purpose of the future lives will not be fulfilled. Striving for the benefit of the future lives will enhance the results in this one. <clears throat> and so thinking only of seeking, seeking only the benefit for this life alone, and you will not actually fulfill the goal of this teaching. <clears throat> so, you should have the motivation of compassion, the compassionate motivation <clears throat> to serve others and not thinking selfish motive. And Chandrakirti uh, also s says, Compassion alone is important. In the beginning, in the middle, in the beginning means before entering the path, in the middle, after becoming a Bodhisattva, and in the end, after becoming a Buddha. And so, the, here, Master Chandrakirti in a Madhyamaka Avatara praises compassion for, first of all, as a seed for bodhicitta, and then in the middle, once you have become a bodhisattva, to enhance your bodhicitta further and further and then uh, uh, progress along the path, and in the end, when you become a buddha, as the fully ripened crop, to benefit others, and therefore he praises it other than, pra and rather than praising the other qualities of the Buddha. So if one strives for this life alone, the purpose of future lives will not be fulfilled. Striving for the benefit of future life will enhance the results in this one as well. And then next is the disciples generating into the principal deity. So that, uh, the earlier one was uh, bearing the correct motivation, or correcting one's motivation, and bearing the motivation of bodhicitta. And so, as I explained earlier, in order to achieve the form body of a Buddha, it, it, must, it comes from the collection of merit, where uh, the, the form body is for the uh, benefit of others, and then the dharma body is for uh, fulfilling one's aim. You need that of the collection of wisdom. So, of course, in the sutrayana also, there is the practice of accumulating merit as well. But to do that in a great way, what we must understand is that this body that we have now, the contaminated body, cannot actually turn into the Buddha's body. And therefore, we need to cultivate a special body. In the lower tantras, there is not much explanation of it, this. Because there is no explanation of uh, the practices on the basis of distinction between the degrees of subtlety within the mind, gross and subtle and subtle most, and so forth. Uh, 
So what we should do in Tantra is to, to transform our perception of the ourselves as ordinary and have the perception of oneself as a deity. Of course, this body that we have now, the made up of blood, bone, blood and flesh, is not perceived in itself as becoming the body of a deity, but we should first dissolve it into emptiness. So as we say, everything dissolves into emptiness. And from within that meditation of emptiness, from within the state of emptiness, you arise into the form of a deity. And so here, the sensory perceptions are not actually, uh, have no work. You use your mind itself. And they're using that mind to meditate on emptiness, perceiving or thinking that there's nothing which is inherently existent, as uh, Madhyamaka Avatara says. Uh, the, through the sevenfold reasoning, so if things were to have any intrinsic ex inherent existence and so forth, so Master Chandrakirti says that nothing has any inherent or independent existence, and because if you actually uh, posit or assert inherent existence, then there would be four different absurd consequences that you would that would fall on you, and then he says the things exist by way of convention alone, and conventions must not be. Uh, 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 you call analyzed uh, through the ultimate analysis. And so, the, if things were to have any uh, uh, true or inherent existence, then the conventions, conventional truth, would with, be able to withstand ultimate analysis, and therefore that's not the case. And therefore, nothing whatever has any inherent existence, but things exist merely by way of designation. As Mother, Master Nagarjuna's intention is that, he also says, Whatever arises through dependence, into, to dependence is, is said to be empty, and that is also said to be designated as the middle way. Whatever arises through, de whatever is dependently arisen, um, there's nothing which is not dependently arisen, therefore there's nothing which is not uh, empty. And so Jetsongkapa also says, So, Jetsongkapa says that Within emptiness, understanding of emptiness, you should be able to assert the uh, causality of things. And so, if we think through, there's nothing that is intrinsically existent, but the things do exist by way of convention alone. So Buddha himself cannot be found when we do scrutinize him. 
As Master Nagarjuna himself says in the 22nd chapter of Mula Madhima Kakarika, he is not the uh, aggregates, nor the aggregates are not different or separate from the aggregates. He does not possess the aggregates, nor the, pos the aggregates possess him. He is not uh, within the aggregates, and nor with, uh, he, uh, the aggregates within him, and he does not possess um, the aggregates. What else is Tathagata? And so this verse can be used to apply to yourself also. You can say not uh, one with aggregates, not separate, not within the aggregates, nor am I within it, and I do not possess it, uh, the aggregates, who am I? So if you think of yourself, you, of course you have a body which is tangible, and then you say, my body, speech, and mind. And so these body, speech, and mind are mine, you will say. But where is that you, I? And so if you think along this verse from Nagarjuna's 22nd uh, uh, chapter of Mula Madhimaka Karika, which I also use, you will find that you can't actually f pinpoint at something as being yourself. But self is not inexistent. Self or person exists, but not intrinsically. And therefore, you meditate on emptiness, and you will be able to see that you are not the aggregates and so forth. And this appearance of the aggregates that you usually cling on to as being mine and yourself actually disappears. And then you, your mind is absorbed in emptiness. And from within that absorption in emptiness, you ever arise into a deity. And your body, speech, and mind as a deity do not exist intrinsically, as this mantra refers to. Om Swabhava Shuddha Sarva Dharma. Swabhava means empty of, devoid of, inherent existence. And Sarva Dharma means all dharmas, all phenomena also are devoid of any intrinsic existence. And so, Om Swabhava refers to you, and all Sarvadharma refers to all the aggregates and the other uh, phenomena. And so, you and the aggregates have no intrinsic existence. They are devoid of any intrinsic existence, whatever. And so, what you ascertain through this kind of analysis and is that of emptiness. So you ascertain emptiness. And so that mind which, is, which ascertains emptiness arises in the form of a deity. So having the ascertainment of emptiness, and then from within that state of mind with absorption in emptiness, absorbed in emptiness, you arise into a deity, and therefore there is the cause for both the form body and the dharma body, dharmakaya and the, uh, the rupakaya. In tantra, this can be explained. But the detailed explanation cannot be done in the lower tantras, like in this case, Avalokiteshvara initiation comes within the lower tantra here. And so everyone, please meditate on emptiness. Om Swabhava, thinking along this mantra, Om Swabhava Shuddha Sarva Dharma Swabhava Shuddha Hang. And also uh, the lines that I quoted from Mula Madhimaka Karita and also uh, Madh uh, Madhimaka Avatara. So if you think along these lines and reasonings, you will be able to ascertain that things exist 
merely through the appearance to the mind. Apart from that appearance to the mind, things cannot exist or do not exist. And so that you ascertain things, whatever has no, any, uh, no intrinsic existence, and absorb your mind in emptiness. And from within that state, you arise into Avalokiteshvara with one face and two um, uh, hands. Please repeat this. Please repeat. Oh, great, please, you are my teacher, so master, please pay attention to me, the firm way of great enlightenment, I beg you, O oh, protector, please grant me the pledges, the spirit of enlightenment, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, O oh, protector, please lead me to the supreme city of enlightenment, see the last two words three times. Oh, protector, please lead me to the supreme city of enlightenment. Oh, protector, please lead me to the supreme city of enlightenment, uh, liberation. And therefore, having said this three times, repeated this three times as a request, next is, uh, since the, you, the disciples, have total faith, and trust, the master says, my child, come here. So far, you are carried away by your negative emotions, because of which you created karmas, and therefore you suffer, and therefore you are overcome with suffering all the time. But suffering is because it has cause, and the cause is ultimately ignorance, which is, has no sound basis for what it perceives and conceives. Therefore, since all the other negative emotions arise through this clinging to true existence in things and self, and this clinging to true existence of self and others, other things has no sound basis. But we ha all have Buddha nature as um, Maya um, Anuttara Yoga. Anuttara Tantra, the uh, Maitreya's um, Anuttara Tantra says. So what the distorted minds, distorted perceptions have no sound basis or foundation, whatever. Whereas the, the wisdom of emptiness, realization of emptiness and compassion are not rooted in this kind of distorted conception or distorted perception like ignorance but they are based on correct reasoning. And they are logical. And therefore, it gives this courage. And um, confidence in us. So those the, uh, perceptions or cognitions which have a sound basis the more you practice them, the you can increase them, whereas the other ones which have no sound basis, no sound logical background, and the more you um, develop this wisdom and so forth, these subside and decreases. And therefore, what they hear what he said here is, I will correctly teach you this ritual of conduct of the Mahayana secret mantra. And you are, as I explained already, the wisdom of emptiness and the meditation of yourself, visualizing yourself as a deity, where you have both the appearance and empty together, combined. You are a great suitable vessel, possessing the Vajra body, speech, and mind. All the Buddhas of the three times found the perfect, unequaled, exalted wisdom through the power of the Vajra mantra. So, of course, the body, speech, and mind that we have now cannot be said to be of indivisible, inseparable, 
Whereas, in this, according to the highest yoga tantra, when we explain these body, speech, and mind in terms of the subtlest aspect, they are of the same nature. And so, the expression of this subtlest body is ah, which is the speech. And therefore, the subtlest wind energy uh, always is inseparable from the mind. Therefore, you have the body, speech, and mind inseparable in that way. The line of Shakyas, Shakyamuni, Buddha, and uh, the Supreme Ones used unparalleled practices of the sacred mantra to destroy the hordes of incredible and powerful evils. After knowing the world would follow them, they turned the wheel of Dharma and passed into the state of beyond sorrow. So in order to attain omniscience, my child, exert your intelligence. And so the Buddhism that, sp that spread in Tib uh, uh, in Tibet is from the Nalan tradition, and particularly we have this Tantrayana. And so, with the basis of the basic, the foundational teachings, and then we have the Tantric teachings on, uh, um, to add on to that <clears throat> to achieve the goal of omniscience. And next is taking the uh, vows. Uh, bodhisattva vows first. <clears throat> so with regard to this, so I do the uh, self-initiation in connection with uh, Lama Chepa, uh, Guru Puja. So today I, I got up very early in the morning and I did this self-initiation in connection with Lama Chepa and also the self-initiation uh, because of this uh, initiation of Avalokiteshvara that I am giving now, today. <laughs> so I, I have done the, the since I have done the self-initiation, my uh, bodhisattva vows have also been um, refreshed, so to say. So Yangdi Rambuche is uh, informing His Holiness about the... So His Holiness is going to give the uh, layperson's vows now. So in order to um, train in the Dharma in, in a sequential order, uh, we first take the layperson's vows, and then uh, the uh, Getsu, the novice monks and nuns, and then the Bhikshu and Bhikshuni vows. And so once you receive, you have received the bhikshu vows, you have, uh, you are supposed, I mean, you are, um, what happens usually is that people, after taking bhikshu vows, um, they, they progress in their realization, and then they disrobe. He's only just joking. So the Buddha himself also was a layperson and took layperson's vows and then became, went forth to become a monk. And so here, the lay people, men and women, as a preliminary to the genetic initiation, Avalokiteshvara initiation, please have the intention to uh, take the, uh, the, the uh, lay person's vows. <clears throat> Just as the past um, arahats and so forth have avoided Taking life, I will not take life of others or killing others. 
And similarly, I will uh, not take what is not given, and I will not indulge in sexual misconduct. I will not take alcohol, which is which is a source of. Um, a recklessness. And so, just as the past Arahat and so forth have given up killing, stealing, and so forth, I will not do... I will also um, en uh, not engage in killing and so forth. So I have a story to tell here. My late... Uh, senior tutor Jabjan Ling Rambuche once gave these uh, layperson's vows to a Tibetan elder, uh, elderly Tibetan ma uh, man. And then, when Ling Rambuche explained to him that he cannot drink alcohol, and this elderly man, rubbing, uh, scratching his hair, head, said that I cannot stay without chung, uh, alcohol. So, Jabji Ling Rinpoche, being a body, compassionate bodhisattva and skillful bodhisattva, very skillfully told this elder, Tibetan elderly man, in that case, don't take too much alcohol, okay? Just a little bit. And so, for you also, the lay people and lay, lay men and women, you may also take a little bit of chang, enjoy it, but not to the point of getting drunk, because it doesn't help. And so, avoid killing. So taking, avoid uh, stealing, avoid sexual misconduct and telling big lies, and then avoid taking, uh, drinking alcohol. And so with this, The thing in Solon is, uh, has finished with the, um, the layperson's vows. So imagine having explained the vows. So next is taking the Bodhisattva vows. <clears throat> so Bodhisattva vows is something incredible. So it gives you great courage and confidence, joy in your heart. <clears throat> Please repeat these lines in the, sp in the space in front of you. Imagine your Lama, Avalokiteshvara, and his mandala, and the retinue deities, and so forth. So imagine the Buddha of our times for the teaching of the Buddha. And then the bodhisattvas like Maitreya of Manjushri and so forth, and Master Nagarjuna's masters such as Nagarjuna and Asanga and so forth. So because we have access to their writings, we can actually say, oh, Master Nagarjuna, if somebody asks what, how Master, uh, uh, what kind of person Master Nagarjuna was, I mean, we can actually explain to them, oh, this person has written such and such texts and this says this and that. So these are texts that we can actually study and we can actually understand through them the basis, the path, and the um, resultant uh, stage that we can reach. And therefore, we can feel them to be infallible objects of refuge for us. And so imagine, visualize the Buddha, mainly, uh, surrounded by the eight bodhisattva close uh, disciples, uh, and then around them, the masters of the profound and the extensive conduct lineage, uh, profound view lineage, and the extensive conduct lineage. 
So imagine this entire object of refuge, beginning with the Buddha, the Bodhisattvas, the Masters, and so forth. The text for the Bodhisattva vow, if you just think along these two lines, in order to fulfill the interests of myself and others, I generate the mind for enlightenment. So if you wish, even if you wish to fulfill your own goal, you need bodhicitta. If you wish to help others also, you need bodhicitta. If you have bodhicitta, you are more calm and you, have, you gain more friends. So even you will even be kind to bugs, insects, and they will be attracted to you. And whereas if you remain angry, and even the bugs would actually run away from you. And therefore, these two lines are very powerful. And by generating, after having generated the mind for supreme enlightenment, I should invite all sentient beings as my guests. I engage in the supremely appealing conduct of enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. May I attain Buddhahood. Please repeat these lines after me. So every day, regarding myself, as I, every day as soon as I wake up, I think or reflect on bodhicitta and the wisdom of emptiness. I do practice a lot of deity yoga practices. Do <clears throat> but the real factor, the real thing that actually transforms me our bodhicitta and the wisdom, the realization or the wisdom of emptiness, which gives me joy and feel relaxed. I see refuge in the three jewels. I confess in all my sins individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all beings. I take my heart, Buddha's enlightenment. I seek refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly until I'm enlightened in order to fulfill the interest of myself. And as I generate the mind for awakening, by generating the mind for supreme awakening, I should invite all sentient beings is my guess in I engage in supremely appealing contact of enlightenment for the benefit of all beings and may I attain please repeat for the second time I seek refuge in the three jewels I confess all my all sins individually I rejoice in the virtues of beings I take the heart of this enlightenment, I see refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly, until I'm enlightened in order to fulfill the interests of myself and others, I generate the mind for awakening. I should invite all sentient beings to my guests and engage in the supremely appealing conduct of enlightenment. For the benefit of all, so the Bodhisattva practices, uh, is referred to as that which is supremely appealing. So not only having generated bodhicitta within yourself, but also applying yourself in the practices of bodhisattvas, which actually makes your life meaningful. So, having generated the mind for supreme awakening, I shall invite all sentient beings and my guests. I engage in the supremely appealing conduct of enlightenment for the benefit of beings. May I attain Buddhahood. So, with the two lines, in order to fulfill the interests of myself and others, I generate the mind of enlightenment you generate bodhi, the aspiring bodhicitta, whereas the next three lines refer to the, uh, the uh, engaging bodhicitta, which means you take refuge, uh, you take bodhisattva vows through this. So the vows comprise of the 18 root downfalls. The 18 root downfalls are as it is given in the sixth session, Guru Yoga, which says praising oneself, despising others, and so forth. So if you actually curb or so praising myself and belittling others and not sharing the Dharma teaching and wealth and so forth. 
So here there are 18 root downfalls to be avoided. The main practice here is to, to uh, restrain self-cherishing attitude. Please repeat for the second time the Bodhisattva vows. And imagine that you receive, at the end of this repetition, third repetition, you receive a full set of bodhisattva vows, pure bodhisattva vows, just as it is within this mind stream of the, uh, the Lama. And if you have bodhisattva vows and not cause decline to it, they are enhanced. And uh, if you have not received it before, you receive it fresh. I seek refuge in the three jewels. I confess all my sins individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all beings. I take to my heart with this enlightenment. I seek refuge in the Buddha. I am supreme community until I am enlightened. In order to fulfill the interests of myself and others, I generate the mindful awakening. By generating the mindful supreme I shall invite all sentient beings to my gifts. I, I, the, I shall engage in the supremely appealing contact of enlightenment. May I attain to the hood for the benefit of all beings. As it is said in um, Bodhisattva Charya Avatara, just as the past Buddhas have generated Bodhicitta and then engaged in the Bodhisattva practices, likewise I'll do so. And then Today my life has borne fruit. I have attained the excellent human existence. Today I'm born into the Buddha's family and now I have become a Buddha's child. Now come what may, I shall act in accord with this lineage, never causing this impeccable noble lineage to be tarnished. And then today, before the, all the protectors, the Buddhas, and uh, bodhisattvas, I shall call on all sentient beings to the feast of enlightenment and in the meantime, happiness. Therefore, gods, demigods, and so forth, be joyous. And so, which we should think of being sympathetic with all sentient beings, that we will suffer together, we will be in good times together. And so uh, we will, the, we, we, call, um, we, we should think of uh, reaching Buddhahood together and so forth. And next is receiving the blessings. So all the disciples, you have already visualized yourself to, uh, in, uh, as Avalokiteshvara and think that you, there is appearance of yourself as Vavagadishwara, but you are empty of inherent existence. At your heart, there is a black five-pointed Vajra in the center of which is a black syllable hum on a sun. At your throat, a red syllable um, a re throat, a red eight-petaled lotus in the center of which is A on a moon, and at your crown, a white eight-spoked wheel in the center of which is a white ohm on a moon. So please think that, imagine that your three doors are being blessed with this Hong A Om. So standard word is applied on the Vajras of the heart, throat, and crown with Hong A Om, three syllables, touching the heart, throat, and your crown. And next, the three places are blessed. Visualize that the flowers are offered to the crown of the disciples, who are visualized as deity, incense to the nose, but a lamb to the eyes, and scented water to the heart. So, Vajra Pushpe Dupe Aloka Gente. Through these, the offerings are made to the disciples. So, there is no. Uh, 
So there's no, uh, we are not doing the kusha distribution of kusha grass and so forth. And then with regard to the protection court, the best protection for you is that of the maitre or loving kindness. If you practice loving kindness in Bodhicitta, there is nobody whom you will consider as someone evil harming you and so forth. So, Om Buddha Metri Raksha Raksha Sarva Na Swaha. With this mantra, the blessing code is distributed. So, he's only said the others are not so important, giving the handful of water, kusha grass, and so forth. And next is invoking delight. The presence of the omniscient ones in the world is intermittent, and therefore there are times when none arise at all. The appearance is intermittent like the Udamvara flower, which blooms only once in a hundred years. So, of course, the different religious traditions are helpful, beneficial to their followers. So, for the practice, to support the practice of um, the, uh, these different religions. Uh, other religions have the philosophical idea of a creator God, which also helps their followers to practice love and compassion. For us, as Buddhists, we do not believe in a creator God, but you are your own master, as the Buddha himself has said. And then the Buddha also has said, O oh, monks and scholars, just as gold is tested by burning, cutting and rubbing, likewise, you should examine and thoroughly examine my teaching and experiment it, and then accept it, not because you have faith in or devotion in me. So he's, uh, the, the uh, Buddha is um, confident in saying such a thing, and therefore he gave the, uh, the uh, monastic vows. So he taught the Four Noble Truths, and then the uh, 37 aids to enlightenment or liberation. And then, when he taught, the th in, in the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, he taught the perfection of wisdom teachings. So in the beginning, when he taught, in the beginning he taught the Four Noble Truths, and the, the aspects or the characteristics of the the truth of suffering, impermanence and so forth, the four. And then with regard to the true cessation, what we need to think and reflect on is whether destructive emotions can be overcome or not. So if you think along the, uh, the lines from Master Nagarjuna's Mulamadimaka Karika, where he says, um, eliminating karma and delusions, there is liberation. And karma and delusions arise from uh, inappropriate, uh, inappropriate thinking or exaggerated thinking. And that in turn is rooted in elaboration and that is ended or uh, by um, emptiness. So, with regards to the empty, uh, the, the perfection of wisdom teachings, Master Nagarjuna explicated the explicit uh, content, which is emptiness, whereas Maitreya's um, Abhisamayalamkara uh, and so forth explicated the uh, implicit content of the perfection of wisdom teachings, which is the progression along the path. And Master Nagarjuna himself has said that uh, the teachings of the Buddha are based on the two truths, the conventional and the ultimate truth. And so if you are able to understand the two truths, then you will be able to understand the teaching of the Buddha well. And so 
the teaching based on the two truths forms the foundation of the teaching of the Buddha. And so the, uh, the possibility of attaining true cessation is proved in the second turning of the wheel of Dharma. The teaching on the true cessation and then in the third turning of the wheel of Dharma, um, <clears throat> the Buddha taught that of the subjective clear light, which is the subtle clear light mind, the clear light mind. Whereas in the second turning, the Buddha taught object clear light, which is emptiness. Kungdang Tempe Dume has said that the teaching of the Buddha is like leading us from the base of a, a hill up to the top of it. And so, as you progress along the path, you will go through a journey higher and higher. So in the Mahayana Uttara Tantra, there are nine um, examples or analogies used. So this has to do with the, the sequential practice within the practice of the Buddha. Uh, Buddhism. So the Buddha himself has been very skillful teaching in accordance with the mental dispositions of his disciples. So we, as followers of the Nalanda tradition, do follow the triple process of study or hearing and listening to the teachings and then contemplating or reflecting on them, teaching, and then finally meditating or uh, applying the teaching, integrating teaching in meditation. So we are at this outline of generating delight. But Rinpoche was a very good lama but not a very good scholar as such. So in, here in the text, it says, like the Udumvara flowers, the appearance of in, is intermittent like the Udumvara flower, which blooms only once in a hundred years. <laughs> so the, the word for uh, occasionally uh, was actually interpreted differently by him. Through many millions of eons, I have performed all sorts of negative acts. Through seeing a mandala such as this, if I eradicate all, them all, I will be known. What is, need, what, is, what need is there to speak about the limited less contact of mantra? If, res, if I recite the sacred mantra of the protector, I will transform into the unsurpassable state and so forth. And so, as Tibetans, we are born in the land where we have the complete teaching of the Buddha. So the three pitakas, we uh, have the tradition of studying them, and then the practice of uh, applying the three trainings of morality, concentration, and wisdom within ourselves. So unless you lack in your effort in studying and practicing this teaching, there we have the tradition where we have the practice of actually making the gross states of mind kind of subside and in the finally 
um, as the subtle mind and, uh, becomes more and more manifest, the, these kind of slowly are er eliminated or pacified so that you go through the process of dissolution um, into the subtle um, mind, subtlest mind, down to the subtlest mind, which is called this um, uh, going through the process of dissolution, whereby you go through the dissolution of the, um, and the whitish appearance, reddish uh, uh, increase, blackish near attainment, and finally the all empty clear light state. And so the text says, using these make all beings become like you and thus become sugatas. <laughs> so next is instructions on analyzing dream. And uh, repetition or reciting the mantra for checking your dream. So tonight, it's not very important to have the kusha grass and others, but since you have taking part in this preliminary process of initiation, do your best to reflect on, uh, think of bodhicitta and the view of emptiness, and repeat or recite Om Mani Peme Hum, the six syllable mantra. And as you go to sleep, you should be able to um, fall asleep within the state of a very virtuous state of mind through the meditation on bodhicitta and the view of emptiness. If they are too strong, you will actually lose sleep. So, so in other words, it is said that you should check your dream after having cultivated or settled your mind in a very virtuous state. So, Sri Beza Gordahaya Giva Hulu Hulu Humpe is the mantra that would be good to recite. So, tonight, also, Sri Vajra Groda, Haya Griva, Hulu Hulu Humpe, would be helpful to um, help you check a dr your dream. <laughs> so we are done with the preliminary process of the, init the uh, initiation, the great initiation of Avalokiteshvara. So today you, I have born into Buddha's family, and I have become a Buddha's child. With this, feel delighted and feel calm and relaxed, feel at ease. These are dedication prayers. Dagi Gavit, or the dedication prayer from the prayer, uh, summon the Badr prayer. So tomorrow is the actual initiation of Avalokiteshvara. So Thurman, Robert Thurman has requested Jenang uh, of, of blessing of Simhanada, Avalokiteshvara. So we'll do that tomorrow. Thank you. Bye bye.
Oda diyorsun. 